My name is Reuben Salter, Jr., and my parents was obviously Reuben Salter, Sr. My mom was Mitty Mae Oliver. That was her maiden name. Uh, <laughs> I was born in Mississippi by accident. Uh, my parents, as most black people do, come at that age uh, in, in the mid-30s and 40s later on. They went back to their home for a religious, they call it either big camp meeting or revival. <laughs> and the doctor had said that my mom would have enough time to go and come back to where we were from, a little town called Freeport, Illinois. So <laughs> I was born early, and the doctor apparently liked to hit the bottle a little bit. <laughs> and so he did not file a uh, birth certificate or anything for uh, a while, so they finally uh, got him to do that. But by the time I got back to Illinois, within the last couple of weeks uh, after being born, um, and my mom and dad was proud of me. I was first born of that, so they, they, they took me to uh, a, a creamery, an ice cream place where they made ice cream and sold sodas and everything. We live in a small town. I'll get to that in a moment over there. But anyway, the owner of the place looked at me and said, are you sure you got the right baby? You look like a white boy over here. You know, and, but my sin kept getting darker and darker. But, well, anyway, uh, I have uh, my, my parents and my uh, grandparents, both on both sides. My grandmothers were my heroes. They were fiery people. They took no stuff from anybody in Mississippi, uh, and uh, uh, my great-grandparents, um, apparently uh, she was a house uh, slave. Uh, her job was to take care of the missus, and that was a slave on his name. And she was, a best we could figure out, uh, she was probably eight or nine years old by that time, uh, 10. And that's when uh, General Sherman led the Civil War, the, 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 the Union Army on his march to the sea. And apparently they, at that time, the armies fed off of the land. So the, the, the whites on the slave, on the plantation that she was on, they would take the food and hide it in the, in, in the, in the swamps. Uh, to keep the uh, Union armies from getting it. But uh, apparently the, <laughs> the Union armies didn't buy that. So they stopped at this plantation, and uh, they kept asking the missus where was the food and where were the men. And she would refuse, and apparently they got rough with her, and they was dragging on and pulling the hair out. And my, <laughs> my, my great-grandmother said she was hanging on to them saying, you leave my missus alone over here. So when she got older, her favorite story to tell at that time was that uh, had she known what was going on at that time, uh, she would have told him, say, you kiss that, you, you, you whoop that bitch's ass over there. You know? <laughs> so, but she didn't know. Of it. It's estimated that uh, 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 she was probably at her death a, uh, maybe 108 years old. People live a long time in our family. I don't know if you saw the movie Jones Country. Uh, it, it's uh, 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 in the hill part of Mississippi. <laughs> and uh, after the Civil War, Reconstructionists came in. The country was so poor in the land, there were never many uh, um, plantations at that time. At the most, uh, you were rich if you had 12. Well, when the Civil War and the Reconstruction era ended, the poor whites just got up and left. They just left that part of the country because they could not make a living or do anything. And eventually, uh, my side of the family, the other side of the family, um, uh, just homestead of the land. The Reconstruction uh, um, schools taught them how to, to read and write, and also proper marriages. 
And when when the Reconstruction era ended, um, my grandfather and some more people figured out they owned about half of the uh, uh, of the county. Uh, every, everybody left. Uh, so what they did was at that time. That's what became interesting. I, I guess education is my own. Um, the state of Mississippi apparently said, look, we will build you colored folks a school, but you got to get the money and the land for us to build it on, and you, and we will pay for a school teacher. Well, they didn't think they could find any school teachers. So one of my uh, uh, um, great uncles uh, gave the land where the school was built. Now, there's a correlation of that that great uncle. He happened to have a, a, a great grandson of by the name of Bobby Johnson, PET people. Uh, that's my second cousin. Bobby's my second cousin. Uh, but anyway, they owned all of basically all of the county and uh, the southern portion of it. And uh, so whenever the uh, family members uh, got to be uh, 15 or so. They put them on, and I'm sure this happened in every family, they put them on a train, sent them north. Uh, so that's how, and where I live, a little town called Freeport, Illinois, it's uh, right on the Illinois, Wisconsin, Iowa border. You could throw a rock. Uh, well, the... The Wisconsin border was 11 miles away, uh, and um, the Iowa was approximately 40-some uh, miles away. But the important part was, and, and blacks, when they left the South, they went to a family someplace. In our case, it was Chicago, and from Chicago, and there's always not somebody who took in everyone. Aunt Sally was the case over here. Uh, so <laughs> when my and when they left there, they went to Freeport, Illinois for two reasons. Uh, number one is that in the uh, early 1900s, uh, steam engines could only go 120 miles before they had to be uh, exchanged. And they called them division ports. Freeport was a division point this. And also they had, uh, blacks had been very heavily recruited to build the Illinois Central Railroad, which went, it went all the way from New Orleans straight through uh, Mississippi, Tennessee, and Chicago. And uh, um, so when my dad got to be uh, old enough they put him on a train and sent him to Chicago. And from there, uh, he went to Freeport to live. So that's how our family got. And that was uh, in 1924, someplace uh, that he got around that time. And my dad has always been a person. He never wanted to work for anybody but himself over there. And uh, I told you that my grandmothers on both sides oh, were there the heroines in my lifestyle. Um, my, my maternal grandmother uh, actually would have been wealthy had it not been for uh, the influenza in the 1918. My grandfather on that side of the family was in the lumber business. He had trucks, he had uh, mules, teams, and then the depression and influenza, uh, he died and, and left uh, my grandmother with uh, uh, this business over there and she couldn't run it. Whites just came in without bankruptcy. They took everything they had. They didn't, they didn't bother about her, but the bankruptcy. But they left her uh, uh, five acres and I'm sure it must have been more than two mules, but she went out, and they had, I had about five uncles who eventually 
two of them got me out here to uh, learn about Arizona. But in any event, but what were they going to do with me? So they put me in school two, two years ahead of time. I, I graduated from high school at 16 because I started early. Well, my family, uh, uh, in my opinion, uh, uh, an unusual family. Uh, on, on both sides of the family, um, education, uh, religion, and, and, and social work was just a, something that they came about in, in Mississippi. Uh, my grandparents uh, fed four whites who, who came to that they had nothing. Uh, it didn't make any difference. Um, so my grandmother on my mother's side, uh, uh, she was, she more than likely would have had a PhD if he said, when I went to college and I would come home uh, with my books and she would come out and say in the window, she'd grab me for me. She said, oh boy, is that what they teaching you? Uh, and she says, I said, yeah, grandma, that, uh, she said, no. Nah. She was a Republican, uh, and but she was been a, a liberal Republican, and uh, so I became interested uh, in politics and education, uh, which showed up. But growing up in a little small town like Freeport, it had approximately at its height thirty thousand people. Uh, then it started going down, um, probably 500 blacks live in the town, so you basically, and we were all relatives of each other, basically. Uh, so it was a good time growing up, uh, but it was a terrible place to try to stay and make a living uh, for blacks because there was nothing to do afterwards. Uh, when we... Uh, Finally got around to graduating from high school. I never had uh, even thought about uh, um, going to college. My dad uh, had a, what is called a star out mail contract. He took the mail from the, from the, off the trains to the post office. Uh, and from there, all the little distributes all the little small towns in and around Freeport. So he had five trucks and a, uh, I don't know how many people working for him, but uh, he could never see any value in going to college because nobody had ever gone to college. And, well, I take that back. Nobody had ever graduated from college. They had one brother <laughs> that they sent him to uh, uh, Alcorn State <laughs> For, for, for a semester. And he he went, and they thought, I don't know why, the rest of the, his brothers and sisters and uncles thought that, uh, boy, we'd learn everything in the world. So he, when he came back, he didn't even know how to hitch up a mule to a plow. And so they saw no 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 no, no, no value, and that's my dad and going to, going to college. My, and I hadn't thought about it either, but... I don't know, I'm sure as educators, you, you know, they, they tracked kids back at that time. And I would always wonder, well, what happened to the few black kids in the school? Well, I went, because I would be the only one in there as they were tracking me. And, and I was in the library at one time. I'm sure you know about that. Uh, I was in the library one day, and back there, Freeport and the county was the third richest county in the state of Illinois. Incidentally, for you historians, uh, uh, if you're familiar with the Lincoln-Douglas debates, uh, the second one was in Freeport. Uh, I uh, I could look out my window and see the monument where they where it was in the park that it was in. Uh, and, and but anyway, uh, I was in the in, in the library and. Bob may have done this. You take a book and you cut it out, and then you take a water gun and you put it in there. So you pretend that you are reading your book and 
you're shooting water. Well, I didn't know the librarian was behind me. So she kept saying, uh, here, what are you doing over here? She said, you ought, to, you, ought to, you ought to be studying and go to college. I go to college? She said, yeah. They knew who, who you were and what your grades were at that school. And uh, I, I said, I ain't nobody who going to college. So I went home and I said, Mama, the, uh, the librarian said I ought to go to college. And she said, yeah. And Brad said, well, why well, want to do that over here? You can make good money over here, what I'm doing over here. So yeah, I ain't paying for that or that. So my mom's a strong lady. She said, okay. I have an uncle uh, who later, uh, he was a minister. He became the head of the Illinois uh, Ministerial Association. She told my uncle, the minister, she said, said, I think he ought to go to college, but his dad won't pay for it. And, and uh, so she, uh, he said, how much is he uh, that, that he needs? At that time, he said $1,600 because when the librarian asked me, if I was going to go to college or anything, I said, I didn't know anything about no college. She said she gave me a book with, with a catalog with, with college in it. And, and this was in 19, uh, uh, 50, 52, I guess. She, you know, the University of Alabama was the first one. The next one, that ruled me out, and they ruled, they ruled me out as well. Uh, the next one was Arizona. And they had just opened the... Uh, uh, student Union, I think it opened in 51 or so. But it was a nice pitch. I'd never seen a, um, a cactus tree or anything. And said, that looks nice. I want to go there. And so my uh, the minister said, when my mom said, said his dad don't want to pay for it, uh, he said, okay, I'll be by in a minute or two. And she was on the phone with him. He came by and gave us sixteen hundred dollars. I mean, it's hundred dollar bill. I said okay. So when that happened, my dad he was shamed into paying for it. So my, I had two uncles I, who were in the army. They had been stationed in all black units at Fort Huachuca during World War Two. Now they sometimes uh, had a history with a little alcohol embellishing the truth. Uh, they were big, not quite as big as Bob, but they were about six three or so. Uh, and they told me, and my mom said, "Oh, if you if you go to Arizona, ain't nothing out there but Indians and desert." He said, "If you go AWOL, they don't bother to come after you. They just just find you out there in the desert three or three days." So that's my view of what Arizona was like at that time. <laughs> but it wasn't quite like that when I got here. Um, I remember the, the, the night that we got here, I was only 16, remember, and I couldn't open a bank account, so I had not that, uh, she says, I'm going to San Francisco. She was about four years older than me, five. She says, I, I'll go, I'll take him to Tucson, and then I'll go on to San Francisco. Well, she never left Tucson once she got here. Uh, she uh, she liked it. And then my parents bought a house right on the corner of, I don't know if you remember, no, Tucson first in Linden. Uh, it uh, uh, was very interesting. The house and all the furniture in it, we paid $5,500 for it. Uh, and... Uh, I mean, it was furnished, everything in the house over there because the, it was a s soldier who was being sent overseas and his wife wanted to go back wherever they were from. Well, anyway, uh, I, I do, I guess, you know, a little bit about my my family. I have a, a, a brother and a sister. Unfortunately, they they were young, much younger than I was, and... Most people back in Illinois, whenever I'd go back there, they didn't even know I existed. But they saw these two, uh, and they went. My 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 brother went to Iowa State, and he tried to play basketball. There, he was a walk-on, and he figured that uh, 
hey, I'm not getting anywhere uh, as a walk-on. So he became very interested in, in, in college politics. And Ames, I don't know if you've been to Ames, but it is, you ain't going to get no blacks out there. So he had to go. To, his job was to go into Chicago and try to recruit black students to go to Ames. And he graduated from Ames and Area Space Engineer. And uh, my, my sister uh, graduated from the University of Arizona. Uh, and then she went back to Marquette and got her uh, doctorate. And um, my brother was on the diversity team for uh, when, the, when they broke up Ma Bell. And he went to work for Lucent. And when they gave him a, 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 an option to say, okay, uh, you can continue, uh, you can buy this telephone company in Atlanta. He and one other person. So they bought it. And it was a f way of paying them back. Let them make any, he obviously made pretty good money. because he, he retired. He didn't do anything until he, he got tired of that. Then my sister, when he went to Atlanta, I knew she was going to follow. She, she is uh, a department head in the Georgia uh, Health Services Department. And she's about to get out of that now. Uh, so uh, uh, that's that's ever, that's all of the the educational side. Tucson has always been more progressive than Phoenix, and it because it was small, and the university had a great influence on it, uh, even in the black community. So here I am stepping in here uh, in uh, September the seventh, nineteen fifty-two. Uh, it was 106 degrees, about 6.30 at night, and, and me and my aunt, so they, at that time, there was only one motel that had blacks. It was, it, it was a Duke's Motel. We had a room there, and then the next day, Monday, the dorms opened up, so she, my aunt put me in the dorm, and she, she had to open up a checking account because I wasn't old enough. And then she she said, I'll look around. And so she, there was another lady up on 11th Street uh, who, who had a boarding house. And my aunt stayed there. And she stayed and well, I like it here. So uh, here I am here in 1952. I go, there were probably, and it was difficult to tell at that time, maybe at maximum 30 or uh, 40 black kids. And the reason it was difficult, some of them stayed in town. And uh, I stayed in a dorm called Papago Dorm. It was very interesting how, because of my age, uh, I didn't fit in too well with the, the freshmen and kids at the university. Tucson High was right down the street. And uh, where we bought, we were at the, living at the bottom of Sugar Hill over here. And all of the kids around there uh, went to Tucson High. So when I'd get out of class, I'd go down and meet with them. And there'll be people right now who think that I went to Tucson High, even teachers that said that I didn't do that. So basically, I told you there were three areas where they lived in. And one of the areas that uh, they thought would never be anything, uh, they let blacks live up there, was in the foothills. They own the they own land up there, uh, and uh, the other area was a mountain, South South Park area. And strangely enough, while it, it housing may have been segregated in areas you would find a black family any place. The, the first colored school was at 6 and 6. You now know it as 6th Avenue. Some some fellow, they, Caesar, I forgot his last name, was there. Uh, but they decided to build um, a, a school. It's, it's Dunbar now. Uh, 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 
uh, uh, John Springs has done by them. Uh, so the Civil Liberties Union, one of the more liberal groups, uh, and the uh, NAACP uh, had questioned uh, why these kids were segregated here because at that time, in order to go to, to high school, if you graduated, uh, you had to go to El Paso. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if you, you know, you've heard Chris Lander. Well, his mom, Julie Bell, went to, she had to go to uh, uh, El Paso to go to school. But anyway, the, the, the Civil uh, Unity Council and the NAACP uh, convinced uh, the school board that they ought to uh, integrate the schools. They hired uh, a, uh, a, a superintendent of the school. You see Robert Mara, if you see Mara. Well, he came from the deaf and blind school, but he went over to Tucson High and he saw all the black kids. He said, I come all these people uh, in this room over here for, uh, well, they said they have to be in here for homeroom. And he said, no, they don't. And so they, they came up with a, a, a voluntary plan. And I'm not sure you, you're aware that in the 1964 Civil Rights Act, it required uh, the, um, it, it was H-E-W at that time, the Department of Education now, but it was H-E-W, uh, to do surveys of all schools uh, who had been uh, segregated prior to Brown v. Board of Education. And this survey came up and said, um, one, Tucson didn't integrate the schools. All they did was take the Mexicans and the blacks and the teachers that followed them and put them in different schools. But the, and those schools were uh, out in South Park. And um, what eventually was closed, Roosevelt was closed. The, now it's the uh, Pima College uh, uh, campus is where that one was over there now. Well, anyway, uh, the, f the first day of integration, when, when we got here, uh, it was news, you know, so uh, I, uh, the, 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 the principal uh, at, 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 uh, at Dunbar uh, uh, Spring um, was uh, uh, Robert uh, Ma uh, Maxwell. Mr. Maxwell was a strange person. Uh, so I, 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 like everybody, I went to see how this integration is going to go. And he, he told me, come on, come on over here. And he said, uh, I ain't going to take all of this mess. They, they're not doing this right over here. He said, uh, uh, I'm going to keep an eye on them. And so uh, when they did finally integrate, <laughs> one day they took the old uniforms uh, at Safford that, 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 that what the whites had been using and brought them over to, to Maxwell. Uh, <laughs> Uh, for Mr. Maxwell and put him on his desk and said, this is uniform. Mr. Maxwell got up, picked him up, put him in his car, went to 1010, and, <laughs> and set him down and I said, I ain't taking it. I'm not taking this stuff over here. So we became very good friends in that Maxwell family, and Melvin Dixon, Dr. Dixon, that's his grandfather. Uh, and... Uh, um, there were, there were a lot of funny things happened during that, but the serious part of it was that the HEW uh, said they didn't really integrate. They just dispersed people over here. So what happened, it showed that uh, black kids with the lowest in achievement, uh, they were um, disciplined more than anyone. The dropout rate was higher. The, the uh, graduation rate was the lowest. Uh, 
So the NAACP uh, went to the uh, school board and said, no, that's in the right over here. Uh, let's, let's, let's integrate. Well, uh, Soling Tom, uh, I don't know if you go down South 6 over there, the Soling Tom Center there. He, he, he was the national head of the uh, American Legion, but he was also on the school board. And uh, uh, the NAACP had uh, uh, taken this position and, and that we were backed up by HEW, uh, that you didn't integrate. Uh, you just moved some people around. Um, you'd have had no administrators, black administrators or anything. <laughs> and uh, uh, so we went to, uh, uh, we had heated meetings over there. Uh, and uh, we went to uh, one school board meeting and uh, so when Tom, he could hardly speak English. And, and, and uh, not to demean Chinese or anyone else, but he, he said, we know that they don't like it, sue me. Well, you don't tell NAACP at that time to sue you because we were the leading branch, the, the Tucson chapter of the West Coast. Uh, so there was this challenge out there. So they looked for some young, stupid lawyer who just got out of law school and said, hey, uh, you've been in politics around here with us. Uh, uh, you want this case? And I said, and the HEW uh, said, we will provide the, 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 the re not the resources, the national officer gave us uh, $20,000 to start the lawsuit. They also uh, brought in a, insured a, a, a law firm was just starting up in Phoenix. Uh, they all had been, uh, all the lawyers in there had been uh, Supreme Court clerk justices. Uh, and and um, some of them, one of them had been uh, on the, uh, help write the Brown decision. So we, we were in pretty good shape. Uh, uh, they were carrying me along. I wasn't carrying them at that stage. But, well, anyway. Uh, how long so, did the lawsuit last? Right, that lawsuit went for how many years? It is still going on, brother. It's still going on. It's, it's, 50, uh, it's 48 years over here now. During that period of time, uh, this school district has received in DSEG funds two and a half billion dollars. You know how many zeros that is? That's 12. Uh, uh, so, and I got my share of it over there too uh, because they have to pay. Part of the settlement was they, they had to pay these law firms in the Mexican Americas. And you asked how long, Judge, this lawsuit has outlasted uh, four federal district judges. It's been to the Ninth Circuit uh, uh, three times uh, and uh, writ to the United States Court, meaning the, the, Mex the, the school district tried to appeal to the United States Supreme Court. They denied the writ of certiorari, meaning that we won down below again. And two weeks ago, we filed another appeal. Judge Burry in July thought he he was finished. He had been reversed once, but he said, I got it right this time over there. I don't think he got it right. So it's still going. Uh, we're down to the main issue here now is discipline. Uh, black kids are still disciplined at three times the white the achievement level. At the rate that the programs they have going, it'd take about 100 years before they would catch up to. Uh, so... It, it, it's out there and it's still going. Uh, it even outlasted, I don't know, last two weeks, uh, the stall where that, the whole state of Arizona and city of Tucson and black children, Mr. Macklin, owe gratitude, a debt of gratitude to Gloria Copeland. 
Gloria was there from the very beginning with me until her death over there. And um, because of her, Tucson High and all the other schools in TUSD will never be the same. I'm always impressed with the, what John Lewis said. Uh, I think you ought to, and, and I would want people to get up and do something. Just do something out there, but just don't sit on their ass and not do anything and say, hey, uh, I've made it over here because you have not made it over here. And uh, I, I, I think that we got to get rid of a lot of the, the gatekeepers. Uh, they, they know what I'm talking about over here. Uh, and um, you need to become active, I, I think, because there are a lot of poor people out there that need help. I think uh, I would like to see uh, the whole criminal system, and it is going that way, uh, change. I, you know, the, the system as it works now, uh, and I don't care what you call it, uh, we lost the war on poverty. We lost uh, 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 Korea. We lost in Vietnam. And, and of all places, uh, 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 Grenada, the <laughs> island down in Grenada down there. So that's telling us something has to change over here. Uh, and it's slow to come about, but I, I would want the, the whole community, whether it's uh, Hispanic, black, uh, to get up and do something. Because if you don't speak out, nobody's going to speak out for you. And if you have that ability, you ought to do it.